Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and today we're going to discuss testicular cancers. I had the pleasure of being with Dr. Pasquale Benedetto. Uh, I can say with confidence that he is one of the finest physicians in the entire United States, so it's an absolute pleasure for me to speak to him. Thank you for being here. <laughs> You're welcome, Tony. Dr. B, would you please explain what is testicular cancer? So, testicular cancer in the vernacular is basically a a tumor derived from germ cells or mm -hmm. tumors that actually arise from the same cells that um, would make sperm. Mm -hmm. So these are tumors that have a lot of unique characteristics. Um, there are many other types of tumors that might be in the testicle, but when we talk about testicular cancer, most of the time people are talking about germ cell neoplasms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is a seminoma and what is a non-seminoma? <clears throat> Okay, so there's two broad distinctions um, in the category of testicular cancer, and that is seminoma um, and non-seminoma. There's no such thing as a non-seminoma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It really is a, um, a general umbrella term for a number of different kinds of appearances under the microscope. Mm -hmm. That includes things like embryonal carcinoma, <laughs> yolk sac tumor, choriocarcinoma, and teratoma. And that distinction was made long ago, number one, because um, these are different cell lines or cell differentiation within the, the germ cell element, um, but more importantly because the behavior of these two types of, uh, of tumors or subtypes of tumors is very different. Um, seminoma is the biologically less aggressive disease, um, and in the period of time where we did not have good systemic therapy 30 plus years ago. Um, seminoma was clearly the better tumor to have because it was likely to be more localized at the time of mm. diagnosis. Non-seminomatous disease is the more biologically aggressive and with a greater chance that at the time of diagnosis the disease will actually have already spread outside of the primary organ, outside of the testicle, mm -hmm. um, into lymph nodes and the abdomen. So the distinction in the 21st century is mainly an understanding of natural history and treatment decision. It's not as much um, a distinction related to the ultimate outcome, I since see. the outcome for both tumors is really quite good. Mm -hmm. What should prompt a male to suspect he even has testicular cancer? So this is generally a pretty simple diagnosis, and, and the major issue is feeling some abnormality of the testicle itself. So men, should be doing self-examinations, mm -hmm. just like women do breast self-exams. Men should periodically do testicular exams. Your testicles should feel like a smooth egg. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you have some areas that are nodular, irregular, um, or the testicle <coughs> itself is growing much larger than the, um, the other testicle, um, that should prompt you to seek medical attention. So a testicular cancer is basically a tumor, a mass, within your testicle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't really have to be painful. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, most often, it's not a painful um, circumstance um, until it gets very large or there may be torsion of the testicle because of the size mm -hmm. um, and irregularity of the, uh, the tumor itself. So what should prompt you is recognizing that there's a change in the a consistency, size, or contour of your testicle. Yes. What is cryptorchidism and how does that relate with testicular cancer? So cryptorchidism is a, a congenital abnormality in which your testicle has not descended into the scrotum. So actually your testicles form from inside um, your developing spinal cord or mm -hmm. vertebral column. Mm -hmm. um, a certain set of cells come together um, and they become a testicle and they migrate down into the scrotum so that just after birth your testicles will end up in the scrotum. Mm -hmm. When that process is not completely fulfilled and the testicle ends up in some place um, uh, along that pathway, which is called maldescent or cryptorchidism, there's an increased chance that the testicle will become malignant in the mm -hmm. future. So that is one of the major, although not a very frequent, um, risk factor for the development of testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. Are there any other risk factors associated with testicular cancer? Um, there, there really aren't any that have the same significance as cryptorchidism. There are some suggestions that 
maternal ingestion of hormones during a pregnancy could influence um, the development of testicular cancer later in the offspring of that pregnancy, but that's not um, well documented. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, there are no clearly defined uh, other risk factors for the development of testicular cancer. Is there ever an appropriate time to seek genetic counseling if you've been diagnosed with testicular cancer? So this is not generally a genetic disease. There is a, there is a gene abnormality that's associated with testicular cancer, which was in the cell, but not a somatic gene, which you're going to pass to um, other persons in uh, your family. <coughs> and it's not generally part of a syndrome of other genetic diseases. So I would say genetic counseling is probably not um, a critical factor here. What is important is that if you, in fact, have had cryptorchid testis as a kid, this is some information that should be known to you as you move into adulthood because of your risk of getting testicular cancer. I find that there are a number of patients who give me that history mm -hmm. and I will ask them, well, were you aware that you had an increased chance of getting testicular cancer? And usually the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, the, the pediatrician most likely or the uh, primary care physician mm -hmm. is not really educating that person about risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> the other is that if you um, father male children, your offspring have a greater chance of having testicular mm. cancer. So it's another thing to impart to the male offspring of people with testicular cancer. Now, the age incidence of testicular cancer is between the ages of about 15 and 40. Most testicular cancer occurs in the third decade in the 20s. So it's not likely at that point in time that your kid is going to be there to tell them that story. You know, it, This is going to be many years in the future, so it needs, you need to be aware as the patient that this is a risk for your son mm -hmm. um, or your brother uh, and uh, in, make that person aware of that risk. And that's another thing that um, I don't see. Occasionally I see a man who tells me, oh, my dad had this or my brother mm -hmm. had this. So I'm pretty um, straightforward about telling a person who has testicular cancer if they have brothers, listen, you need to make sure that your brothers are evaluated. I mean, even if it's just self-examination. I see. <clears throat> so let's take a step back. Let's say some event has led to the discovery of a testicular mass. What happens next for that patient? So, I mean, usually the circumstances are you go to the physician, uh, physician sees there's an abnormality, uh, they order an ultrasound, send you to the urologist, or they send you to the urologist and the urologist orders the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be some abnormality of that testicle. Occasionally there's a, a lead-in with antibiotics on the supposition that maybe it's um, epididymitis mm -hmm. and an inflammation of the tube. Uh, but if you see an intertesticular mass in a male between the ages of 15 and 40, that's testicular mm -hmm. cancer until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so the, radio the urologist um, will likely say that it's necessary for you to have a surgery to remove that testicle. There really is no biopsy mm -hmm. option that you have, although occasionally the urologist, um, during the course of the surgery that would remove the entire testicle, will send a piece to the pathologist to confirm that it's mm -hmm. testicular cancer. There's one other part of the puzzle that can be helpful in terms of diagnosis, and that is something called tumor markers. Mm -hmm. Testicular cancer is unique in that there are certain proteins that we can measure in the blood that tell us about the activity of the disease. Mm -hmm. And those proteins are something called alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. These are normal in certain times of development, <clears throat> but in a um, adult male, these mm -hmm. should be, uh, there should be a normal range. They should basically be not detectable. And in the presence of a testicular mass with an elevation of these markers, that's pretty unequivocal evidence that this mm -hmm. is a tumor. So if you have that combination, there should be no hesitancy about the surgical procedure. So once you have an intracellular mass, you're in the right age group, whether or not the markers are abnormal, that's testicular cancer until proven otherwise, and, and the surgery is to remove that testicle. I see. Would you please explain what is gynecomastia and why does that happen? Okay, so gynecomastia basically is, a, is breast enlargement in a male. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of things that can do that, but basically there has to be some stimulant to the growth of breasts. And in this particular situation, uh, one of the stimulants is the overproduction of beta-HCG. Beta-HCG is beta-human chorionic gonadotropin. Mm -hmm. And this is basically the chemical that a woman makes during pregnancy 
through the placenta that maintains the pregnancy and also increased breasts so that lactation can occur after um, delivery. Mm -hmm. In a male, the result is some enlargement of the breast. So sometimes an antecedent history to testicular cancer will be the complaint that a young man's noticed that his breasts hurt or mm -hmm. they're slightly larger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, usually that's the, the cause for that is missed um, or dismissed. Um, and one of the things to think about is excess production of HCG and whether this kid might have testicular cancer. I actually saw a young man a few months ago who had exactly that. And mm -hmm. when I asked him, did you have any breast tenderness, he said, yeah. Um, how come you asked me that? And I <laughs> indicated, well, because it's associated with this chemical and his tumor made that chemical. So gynecomastia can be a sign <coughs> of uh, a germ cell neoplasm. And the other thing not to forget is that these tumors can occur in other locations, mm -hmm. not just the testicle. And uh, so you, you, if the testicles appear to be normal, you, you have to remember that you can have um, extragonadal, extratesticular sites mm -hmm. of these tumors, and that may be the cause. I've seen a patient with a mediastinal uh, presentation uh, of their germ cell tumor, whose first uh, symptom, in fact, was um, breast tenderness. I see. How do you stage and prognosticate testicular cancers? Okay, so the staging system for testicular cancer is, is really, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say cumbersome. There, it, it depends on whether you have early stage or uh, more advanced stage. There, there are really three staging systems. There's a TNM staging system, mm -hmm. but the TNM staging system becomes very complex uh, because, in general, you want a staging system in which you go from stage one to two to three mm -hmm. to be indicative of in increasing or advancing disease and, and lesser prognosis. But because you have the component of not only location but size, which may make a difference, the TNM classification is not honestly terribly helpful uh, when you get metastatic disease. There's mm -hmm. the most common would be the International Germ Cell Cancer Consensus Group, which is a um, <coughs> a staging system that developed out of the evaluation of probably 16,000 patients across multiple nations, looking at. Uh, risk factors um, and prognostic outcomes. And th in this system, you divide patient population between seminoma and non seminoma, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and between good, uh, intermediate, and poor risk. Uh, and uh, the distinction there has to do with how high the tumor markers are, whether there's visceral or non visceral disease, and whether the patient has seminoma or non seminoma. Mm -hmm. um, I find a third staging system, which is called the Indiana um, staging system, to be clinically helpful because this defines risk in terms of volume of tumor, location. Uh, so for instance, if you had five pulmonary nodules, uh, that would be no worse than uh, a small retroperitoneal mass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and this is more helpful when you see a patient in front of you to try to risk assess. So what I do is I establish the, the stage in each of these systems and then um, basically make the treatment decision um, on, on the consensus across them. So if somebody has poor risk in one and intermediate in the other, they are treated as poor risk. It's not very likely that you have a situation where you are good risk in one system and mm -hmm. poor risk in another. So the staging system is really not so much TNM. You can, you can stage patients with a TNM, but that's not very clinically um, useful. Um, and so we tend to use one of these other staging systems in terms of risk assessment, which I think is what you want to know. How likely is a patient to go into remission with treatment when they have metastatic disease? I see. <clears throat> Would you please comment on prior preservation and sperm banking for patients? Okay, so 95% of all patients who have testicular cancer should be cured. Mm -hmm. right? Not all of those are going to be cured because they need chemotherapy, but a large number will get chemotherapy. Um, so recognizing that at the onset that the, the patient that you see is likely going to have a future, mm -hmm. I think it's important in the very beginning to discuss the, the thereafter, what happens after chemotherapy. And so in my discussions with patients, I talk about three long-term 
complications of getting chemotherapy. One of which is infertility, mm -hmm. uh, the second is hypertension, the third is Raynaud's. And with regard to infertility, um, I, I believe that the numbers that are quoted in literature are really too high. Um, however, I always recommend that young men bank sperm before they initiate treatment. In fact, most of the patients that I have treated have been able to father children without sperm banking or what, without the use of the banked sperm, but it represents a, uh, an insurance policy. There are occasional um, men who cannot for, for other reasons. Some men will have low sperm counts um, to begin with as a result of having this disease perhaps or um, perhaps a gonadal dysgenesis of some sort. Um, you know, but in the 21st century there are many options for um, childbearing uh, relating to a, a number of uh, technological um, advances. Mm -hmm. So even a few sperm may be adequate. So I always recommend um, cryopreservation of mm -hmm. sperm before initiation of chemotherapy. You obviously have to do it before the initiation of chemotherapy. Right. You, you, can't, <coughs> you can't do it once the chemotherapy starts and so that's an important decision. On an occasional situation, a patient doesn't have the time because they're too sick at, the, uh, at presentation. That, that's not a frequent circumstance. So I always recommend sperm banking. I see. Are there any support groups that, that exist that you recommend? <clears throat> um, there are. Uh, in fact, the, you, you can go through the Lance Armstrong Foundation, for one. That there's a number of avenues through that foundation that tells you what might be available locally. Actually, one of my patients told me that there's a um, a, a life after, I, I think it's called, um, well, I'm not certain what the name of it, it's something descents, and it, it is for survivors of mm -hmm. testicular cancer. It's, it's uh, kind of like a, um, uh, an extreme um, physical mm -hmm. maneuvers. You can go, you know, kayaking or something, or rock climbing, etc. But it's getting involved in other people with the same illness. But this is really after treatment. Mm -hmm. But there are many support groups for, or there can be support groups for patients with testis cancer. Usually there's a lot of online mm -hmm. um, sources. I mean, given that testicular cancer is not a really common disease, it's not too likely that you're going to have a big support group within mm -hmm. a small community. In addition, I mean, this is a disease in which the treatment is of short duration mm -hmm. um, and it's curable. So if you give the patient the right information up front, um, you know, they tend not to be particularly discouraged mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. diagnosis because they should be cured. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may not be happy that they have this disease and have to get treatment, but they have the opportunity um, to overcome this illness. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very prolonged course of treatment. So, you know, by the time you're in the treatment, you're halfway done. You know, nine weeks is is really a very short time mm -hmm. in, in the course of the rest of your life. So I, I, what I do is I will introduce a patient to a prior patient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you go through this, you kind of have a brotherhood, and mm -hmm. people are happy to you know listen. If you have mm -hmm. another patient mm -hmm. with this, I'm happy to talk about them. Mm -hmm. And so if I see somebody's having a difficult time, or maybe they don't have a lot of home supports, I will have a a patient previously treated come and you know mm. talk to the other patient and and you know create a little bit of a support group for them that's a very nice idea well thank you so much for dr. Benedetto thank you for watching we hope this has been educational for you in the coming videos we will discuss the actual treatment of testicular cancer